Uh, so I'm Claudia Pedrero. I'm a lawyer at Eiler Campbell and with me here is Carly Wilson. She's our EdicLink student. Uh, she's going to be giving part of the presentation with me. So today we're focusing on operational and governance issues uh, that have come up for many of our housing clients over the past few months and that are particularly related to COVID-19. So quite frankly, there's so many issues uh, dealing with operations that housing providers uh, have, to, have to deal with. It's such a multifaceted uh, area. There's insurance, public health, uh, issues with funders, uh, and some of these are beyond our expertise. So we're focusing on the, the legal component uh, of, of all of this. And many of you are also likely aware that this is uh, part, the third part of a four part webinar series that our firm is giving throughout May. Uh, the previous two sessions are uh, available to stream for free on our website. So I can uh, encourage you to look at those if you haven't already and uh, to join us next week for uh, Michael Hackle's session uh, with Angela Pollard. So here's an overview of what we're going to cover in today's session. Carly will start off uh, by talking about managing arrears uh, for residents and RGI issues that have come up, as well as dealing with COVID in the building. And I will take the last uh, two issues. So we'll go over governance issues affecting co-ops and uh, nonprofits, as well as uh, building operations considerations and uh, things to think about while uh, when the province starts uh, re uh, releasing some of the restrictions. We'll have some time at the end for questions. So there is a chat box as uh, Fraser mentioned and I think just to keep the flow of the presentation going we'll answer questions at the end. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind uh, for this pr presentation in particular, when we're talking about uh, the laws that apply, we'll be talking about Ontario laws. Uh, th and the presentation is really meant to give general information. There's going to be particular situations that your housing uh, organization might be experiencing, uh, and we may not be able to answer them here. So really do seek professional advice uh, about your particular situation. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, building operations are a, a multifaceted issue that uh, relate to insurance and uh, service providers and funders, uh, and you may need advice from many different sectors, so, so please keep that in mind. And last, some of the information that we're giving you today may change in the next couple of days or, or next couple of weeks, so some of this may be stale fairly soon, and it's important to uh, keep up to date with the most recent government and public health directives. Before we all jump in, uh, it's also worth mentioning that we're giving legal information as part of this presentation, but we can't provide any legal advice. So please keep that in mind when ans asking questions at the end, because we won't be able to answer specific uh, uh, questions that relate to a, a particular situation that you might be facing. So please keep them general. So now I'm going to hand it off to Carly, who's going to talk about managing arrears. Perfect. Thanks so much, Claudia. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is just the situation at hand. Um, basically, what's going on right now is that housing providers do not have the legal wiggle room to waive rent or housing charges without affecting the lawful rent of a unit, um, unless they're following really specific discount rules. And so far, the government has not set up any program that will compensate housing providers if they don't charge or if they don't receive rent. Um, and the reality is that tenants are all living or many of them are living on a lower income. Um, market renters are likely to be the most affected since they're the ones that are losing their income in the event that they're losing their jobs. So to top it all off, the city has asked that all property owners try to find ways to help their tenants stay in their homes. So there's a lot of different competing ideas at play. So what are housing providers going to do? We think the first step is make a plan. Um, the province has been on lockdown for two months 
And those people who may have thought they weren't affected at first are likely now starting to deal with some kind of life changes due to the pandemic. Uh, tenants are likely to feel financial repercussions for months or even years. So coming up with a response for your organization to do and a plan of action is a great and necessary first step. So, whoops. Sorry, I accidentally slipped a slide there. There we go. Um, so what are some of our clients been doing since the pandemic started? Um, a couple of things we've seen entering into repayment plans with tenants uh, if they aren't available to, or if they aren't able to pay their rent right away. Um, some of our clients are serving N4s and N4Cs so that they can be in a position to file at the LTB for uh, housers that aren't, or residents, sorry, that um, aren't able to pay their rent and are getting into arrears. Um, so they're filing now and hoping to have that heard at a later date. And some of our clients have made policy decisions that they're not going to issue any N4s or any NTAs during this period, um, trying to keep an eye on the most vulnerable and waiving all housing charges for one month. So we're really seeing a range of responses depending on what everyone's situation is. Sorry, hang on. There we go. Um, so what are some other options that people might have? A um, Couple of things that you can try. You can continue to build your arrears files. So tenants are still responsible for paying their rent and monthly housing charges right now. There's no freezes in place as of right now. Um, the LTB is not ordering or allowing enforcement for evictions. Uh, but they will again one day. This will all start up again eventually, and evidence will be key to support any future applications. So if you intend to build arrears files for those future applications, we recommend letting your tenants know. Because the range of behavior and responses has been so vast and wide, it's great to give your tenants or your members a heads up that you are continuing the expectation of rent payments, um, acknowledge that evictions are currently frozen, and direct tenants to resources for supports available to help them out if they need it. So that would be a great way if you're building arrears continually to kind of indicate to your tenants that you're still on their side. Um, another option is deferring rent payments. So a deferred payment lets your tenant off the hook for paying on time and allows them to pay off the arrears at a later date. If you're going to defer rent, it has to be clearly communicated to your tenants that the rent is not free for the month, they will have to pay it later. So once again, communication is super important. Um, another option is allowing tenants to use their last month's rent check to cover their next payment. So most tenants have put down a one month deposit for their final month of rent and you can actually let them use that now. So if they're indicating to you that they're worried that they won't be able to pay for their next month. This is a simple solution similar to deferring rent payments that will allow them to pay at a later date. Um, a last option is uh, discounting rent to avoid tenants from racking up high arrears. Rental discounts are available, but they're incredibly complicated. Um, the simple formula is to give a one time discount of less than one month's rent. Um, but if you'd like to offer a discount spread over a few months, I recommend you check out our blog. We wrote a post about this uh, a few weeks ago. That'll give you an opportunity to see how it works and also see how complex it is. So don't start offering discounts without doing a little bit more research. Um, so that's how to manage arrears. Now, some people I know have uh, tenants or members that are on a rent geared to income basis. Um, so you might be wondering how COVID-19 is impacting that. So far, there have been no changes to the administration of RGI. The provincial emergency orders did not say anything about the Housing Services Act, and that's the act that governs RGI administration. Members or tenants that are a part of the RGI program um, already and suffer a loss of income, that will automatically be adjusted in their benefit. Um, but due to the loss, the high loss of employment, many housing providers should be prepared for an increase in applications from RGI tenants asking for a rent adjustment or from former RGI tenants now looking to regain their subsidies. Uh, some housing providers may be able to give out an RGI subsidy to members or tenants looking for some kind of relief. The best thing to do there is contact your service manager that's in charge of 
uh, administering RGI to your units and see if you're in the position to offer any additional subsidies. Uh, if you're curious about that, CHF Canada is an excellent resource, um, even for housing providers that are not co-ops but have a significant number of RGI residents. So I'd recommend looking them up at CHF Canada and look at Ontario co-ops and COVID. Just do a quick Google and you'll be able to find a lot of resources there. So moving away from the money issues for a second, uh, let's look at more about the health side. So what to do about COVID-19 coming into your building. So what to do if a resident or a staff member tests positive, uh, how to protect outsiders coming into the building or how to handle the death of a resident. So first looking at what happens if somebody that you know in the building, either a resident or a staff member tests positive. The first thing to remember is that privacy laws have not changed. So privacy laws have not been affected by any of the emergency orders. So housing providers do not have the right to ask tenants about their health status, whether they've been tested or what the results of that test are. That's all private information. That said, most of you guys know your tenants or members that live in your building and you know that some of them still may want to share or overshare that kind of information. Some individuals may be trying to be proactive or open if they've tested positive for COVID um, and they wanna give, give an explanation if they're self-isolating or they may just wanna share the information and you happen to have people on site. Um, because they're anxious or they're afraid. So just because a tenant tells you about their illness does not mean that you are then free to tell other tenants in the building. This information should still be kept private. So the key is maintaining people's privacy, but also maintaining their safety. So housing providers that are informed of a tenant testing positive do not have an obligation to tell other tenants in the building about a positive case. So if someone tells you you don't have some kind of moral obligation to go tell everybody else in the building that there is a positive COVID case in the building. But that said, uh, you also need to be aware of health and safety concerns. So there are current social distance protocols in place that recommend all housing providers act at all times like you already have a positive case to prevent the spread. So behavior shouldn't really have to change that much if you have a positive case in the building. Having said that, uh, if housing providers are concerned that tenants are not taking social distancing protocols seriously and you want to avoid a spread, especially in larger buildings, it could put a fire under some people if you post a general notice that someone in the building is a confirmed positive case. It may encourage tenants to take things a bit more seriously. Um, at the end of the day, use your discretion, be discreet, and ensure all the staff are following and enforcing social distancing and cleaning protocols. It's the best you can do. Um, what if a staff member gets sick? A bit of a different situation. Uh, Sophia talked about this in her webinar, which was last Wednesday. If people have more questions about employment, it's still up on our website to check out. Um, so briefly though, just to cover a staff member getting sick, um, employers need to be aware of their responsibilities under the Human Rights Code. So if a staff member gets sick, um, you cannot terminate or discipline that staff member. Uh, staff members also still have a right to privacy. So say you have a staff member who gets sick, goes home and is self-isolating for two weeks, um, and some of your tenants or members start asking where that staff member is, do not share any personal information or disclose that they have the virus. Just say that they've had to take some time off or they've gotten a little ill and can't come in. So again, like be honest, but be discreet. Um, so next is uh, outsiders coming into the building. So unfortunately, even though we're all self-isolating as best we can, and this will change as things go on, buildings and housing operations are not isolated bubbles. So it's inconvenient, but some tenants may have to move out during the pandemic. Others may wish to move in. Moving companies were on the list of essential services, so that can, moving companies can come in and out. Um, also, some maintenance requirements may arise that are beyond the scope of what regular staff are able to handle. Essentially, outsiders may be required to come to housing units and they have to be kept safe while they're doing so. So housing providers may have obligations to their insurance providers to protect the health and safety of people in the building. And they also have obligations to tenants to maintain a safe environment. So ultimately, creating a safe environment for everybody should be a priority. Um, 
I've got a note here saying that I skipped a slide about deaths. That's actually coming a little bit later. So don't worry, we'll catch up to that. Um, so that's who you should be protecting. Um, and it sounds like there are some conflicting obligations happening there. So the best way to meet those conflicting obligations and the best way to protect tenants, outsiders, visitors, and your organization from liability is to follow the most recent guidelines available. Toronto Public Health has been keeping those up pretty consistently. Um, and it's always something that should be searched on a regular basis just to make sure that you're following all the steps necessary. Um, avoid bringing in outsiders that are not essential. Reduce unnecessary contact wherever possible. So for example, say you have somebody moving out, do not host an open house for an available unit and have a bunch of people coming in. Schedule separate appointments, clean high contact surfaces in between. Um, I know a lot of people are wondering about masks, which according to the most recent guidelines have not been shown to reduce the spread of the virus among healthy individuals, but they can be encouraged to protect tenants from a potentially ill person from outside the community. So with masks, use your discretion, decide if it's something that your organization is interested in doing. Um, what not to do. Uh, housing providers cannot ban tenants from having visitors come to the building. This is something we've had a few people asking about. If you have a tenant who's having friends over, tenants still have a right to their privacy and a right to their enjoyment of their units. On top of that, a lot of types of interactions between people are still permitted even during social distancing. So you can't really call the cops anytime somebody has someone come over. That said, if you're really concerned about a high volume of visitors, let's say about 20 people coming in on a regular basis to visit a tenant, you can report violations to law enforcement. They have the ability to come and break up groups or to ticket or find people. Um, so let's say you have that situation. You've got somebody coming in. Uh, you've got a tenant who has multiple guests coming in on a regular basis. Um, if they're flagrantly breaching social distancing rules, uh, this is something we'll probably end up seeing more often in the coming months as restrictions are changing and loosening a little bit. You've got a few options about how to proceed. So first, uh, put up notices in your building or send a letter directly to a resident that's causing problems. That's a good way to notify somebody that you see what's going on and you intend to take action. So just kind of put on a little warning light, if you will. Um, second thing you can do, especially while the emergency orders are still in place, you can contact law enforcement about serious breaches of social distancing and they will come break up parties and those residents can be fined. I think the beginning, the minimum fine is $750. So it's pretty serious. Um, as a last option and a dramatic one, uh, if you have evidence of serial and consistent breaches over a period of time, you can serve an N5 or an N5C or an N7 or in 7C. Um, residents that are flouting these rules are technically endangering the health and safety of others, and that could, in some cases, constitute grounds for an eviction. Um, can't speak to the likelihood of a successful application, but this could scare some residents into adjusting their behavior accordingly. Um, so next up, we are going to talk about death in a building. If I can get the slide to change for me here. There we go. Okay, so death in a unit. Um, the first thing you might be wondering about is whether or not it's a COVID related death. The mortality rate of COVID-19 is not very high and most people who do succumb to the virus will likely do so in hospital. So if you do have a tenant or a member dying in a unit, it's not likely that it was a death from the virus. Um, that said, it could happen. Uh, if you have reason to believe that a tenant has died in their unit, First thing you should do is contact police and contact Telehealth Ontario to inform them of your suspicions. So if you suspect that they died of COVID-19, definitely give Telehealth a heads up. They might wanna send medical personnel or have tests done, or they can help you with your next steps. Uh, the police will contact a coroner and that person will likely have protocol ready for COVID-19 deaths as well. Um, as far as cleaning the unit, do not take anything from the unit or clean the unit until the police and the coroner have finished inspecting it. If the death was COVID-19 related, ask telehealth for tips and suggestions for cleaning the unit safely. Um, we know that this disease is spread by droplets, so you don't want to go in there without knowing what you're up against. Um, so telehealth can probably inform you about how long the virus lives on different surfaces uh, and how long you should wait before entering this, the unit. 
Um, another good idea is hiring professional cleaners, which is probably the safest option for everyone. If the death is COVID-19 related, inform any cleaners about that so that they can properly protect themselves. Um, if you do have a death in the unit, I know if anyone's experienced this already, other tenants and members are typically pretty curious about what happened. So communicating with other, res other residents is a tricky situation. As we mentioned before, the privacy laws have not changed. Uh, they weren't affected by any of the emergency orders. So only the next of kin of the person who died in the unit has a right to know about the death of that tenant. Uh, it's likely that other tenants will figure it out pretty quickly that someone has died in the building. And regardless of the cause of death, housing providers should not give any details about how the tenant died. If uh, next of kin or family members ask about the cause of death, let them know that it's the police or the coroner's responsibility to give that information. So none of this should really be falling on housing providers to do. Um, the last thing you might be wondering about is updating next of kin uh, after someone's died in the unit. So it's technically the police or the coroner's responsibility to contact the next, to contact the next of kin for a deceased tenant. So that's not the housing provider's job, it's the police or the coroner's job. That said, they might ask you for emergency contact information, which you can share with them. Um, many people during the pandemic have tried to think of ways to be useful or take preventative steps, try and feel some sense of control. One thing that housing providers can do is ask tenants to review and update their emergency contact information so that if they get sick or something happens to them, you have the ability to notify their family or friends or give information to the police. And I believe that's it for me. So I'm going to pass it back to Claudia. Thanks, Kylie. So I'm going to now talk about uh, some governance issues that our clients have been facing. I'm going to talk about the most common questions that we've been getting, but if there are other uh, governance related issues that uh, people have and would like us to, um, to comment on, please uh, leave some questions in uh, in the chat area and we'll try to address them later. So I'm going to focus on uh, meetings, both members meetings and AGMs, as well as uh, board turnover. And those have been uh, the areas that we've been getting the most questions about. And I'm going to start with members meetings and AGMs. So as most of you know, the provincial re uh, regulations currently in place restrict the number of people that are allowed to congregate together at any one time. Uh, and even at small gatherings, it can be pretty hard to maintain adequate distancing. This means that it's uh, going to be impossible for many organizations to hold their members meetings and, and AGMs in the near future. For organizations that are governed by provincial legislation, so the Cooperative Corporations Act or, or the Ontario Corporations Act, the province has allowed co-ops and nonprofits to hold their members meetings and board meetings electronically, for example, via a video call or teleconference. Uh, and this is regardless of what the organization's governing documents say. So this is regardless of whether your bylaws uh, and rules uh, don't actually allow the, the electronic meetings. The general rule for electronic meetings is that everyone in attendance needs to be able to participate at the same time. So in other words, people need to be able to hear each other and communicate freely. Uh, this means that uh, meetings can't be held via email, which is a, a question that we, can, that we get fairly often. Uh, and organizations holding meetings electronically should really make sure that the, that the platform they're using is secure. And this is especially, the case for board meetings where information that's being discussed might be uh, sensitive or confidential. Uh, the emergency order in place is allowing uh, co-ops and nonprofits to postpone their AGMs and there are specific timelines uh, in the emergency order for doing this. Uh, if the AGM had uh, should have been held on a day that falls during the state of emergency, uh, the AGM can be postponed to a date uh, that's within 90 days after the end of the state of emergency. So right now we don't know when 
these timelines will be, but uh, this, these rules give uh, co-ops and nonprofits some comfort that uh, they don't need to be scrambling to hold their AGMs uh, in the near future. Uh, for federal nonprofits, so those organizations that are governed by the Canada Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, those organizations should check their bylaws to make sure that there aren't restrictions to holding those meetings virtually uh, because the provincial orders won't apply to uh, organizations that are under, under federal legislation. So if a federal nonprofit wants to postpone their AGM, uh, there's actually a, an application to Corporations Canada to postpone the AGM. And it's a, a very simple form on Corporations Canada's website. So uh, you can look at that. Uh, an alternative for nonprofits uh, in holding meetings and holding members meetings is to solicit proxies. Uh, this isn't an option that's open to co-ops because proxies aren't allowed at, at co-op members meetings. Uh, if, an organize, if you are considering proxies, uh, please be sure to look at your governing documents, so your bylaws and your articles of incorporation to see what process is set out there. Uh, and it's a good idea to make sure you get advice before holding a proxy only meeting because it can be very complicated and you wouldn't want the um, decisions made through a proxy meeting to be challenged at some point in the future. Uh, and it's worth noting that even though uh, postponing meetings is what most organizations are doing at the moment, there are certain extreme situations where a special members meeting might be needed on an emergency basis. This is particularly the case if an organization's board loses quorum. Um, so this is when there are no longer the minimum number of board members sitting on a board uh, that can constitute quorum for a board meeting and therefore make decisions on behalf of the organization. In that situation, uh, a members meeting would need to be called on an urgent basis to elect sufficient number of uh, directors to the board. And we've, relatedly, we've been getting some questions on uh, board vacancies. Uh, generally, a director's term lasts until they resign, until they're removed, uh, or their successor is appointed at uh, the members meeting following the end of their term. So this means that if a director was elected for, say, a two-year term, but the AGM is being postponed to a few months after the end of that two year term, that director will continue in office until the AGM is actually held and the successor is appointed. So the fact that the exact two year period has elapsed doesn't mean that that director is automatically off the board. They can, however, resign. Uh, so if a director does resign and there's still quorum, uh, on the board, the remaining directors can appoint someone else to fill that vacancy for the remainder of the unexpired uh, term of the resigning director. But as I mentioned earlier, if uh, there's a resignation and the board loses quorum, the remaining directors must call a special meeting uh, to elect new directors. And if there are no directors or if the remaining directors fail to call a special meeting, then the members can do so and uh, elect directors to the board. So one thing that uh, has come up in the past few months with some of our clients is we've been getting uh, the odd notice that some organizations have not been holding board meetings at all through this time. And uh, we really wanted to stress that it is very important to continue holding board meetings. Uh, some decisions can be deferred, but there are ongoing obligations that directors have uh, for oversight and management of their organizations. And these responsibilities aren't suspended through the emergency period, uh, nor is director's liability. And there are some uh, pretty significant uh, ongoing duties that directors should be meeting, uh, for example, financial management, uh, and that 
really can't be can't be deferred for a number of months. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, directories meetings can be held by teleconference or video call, and it's important that if uh, a resolution needs to be passed and uh, the decision is being minuted, that you make sure that the, there is a proper meeting being held. So. As I mentioned earlier, decisions made by uh, via email usually don't qualify as a, a formal resolution under corporate law. So keep that in mind. And I wanted to mention some of the ongoing management responsibilities that directors have during this term. Um, so financial management is uh, a big one and uh, the board can continue to uh, approve an audit, even if uh, review by the members has to be deferred until the AGM. Uh, Sophia last week mentioned workplace safety. So uh, housing projects are workplaces under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So there are risk assessments that uh, housing providers should be uh, conducting with respect to, to workplace safety. There are ongoing obligations to provide human rights accommodations, uh, maintain insurance, and uh, comply with government, government directives. So now I'm going to move on to talking about some of the operational best practices that housing providers should be considering during this time. It's generally recommended that housing providers have a response plan that addresses the the new landscape and focuses on safety and security of residents and employees. So those of you who attended last week uh, know that housing complexes are workplaces under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Sophia covered this area in much more detail, so I encourage you to look at her presentation if you haven't already. Uh, but in general, as an employer, housing providers uh, should be ensuring uh, workplace safety and implementing mitigation measures that uh, help minimize potential risks for employees. Beyond that, housing providers can encourage prevention measures throughout their properties. There are lots of materials created by public health providers that, that can be distributed. Some housing providers have started using screening protocols for contractors and other people coming into the building. This can be a written screening form that asks people uh, about uh, whether they have uh, traveled within the past two weeks, whether they're experiencing symptoms, etc. And this can be either a written form or done through a verbal conversation. A response plan will also involve keeping up to speed on public health directives and communicating to residents and employees about what the current rules are and what measures an organization is taking. And last, Ontario housing provider networks have some great resources for their members, and they've been a, a very good source of support for, for many of our clients. So on the cooperative housing side, uh, the Cooperative Housing Federation of Canada and um, their umbrella organizations, and then for nonprofits, the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Association. When looking at site procedures, uh, the primary focus at this time uh, should be preventing COVID-19 from being introduced in a community and stopping its spread. So this means that safety and security of residents is a priority and building practices should be adopted to reflect this while relying on public health advice. Uh, this can involve doing a, a bit of an audit of your building policies uh, around maintenance, move-ins, laundry room use, uh, et cetera, and uh, adopting increased cleaning protocols uh, that, for example, Toronto Public Health has a specific resource on disinfection and prevention guidelines for residential buildings that is very helpful and that some of our clients have found useful when uh, trying to think about what uh, measures they should be taking with respect to disinfection and, and prevention. 
Uh, and there are also rules for uh, rules that buildings can adopt about the use of the building in and of itself. For example, uh, limiting entrances uh, that can be used at one time, uh, restricting elevator use to a certain number of people. Uh, and I think the more, the bigger picture thing to keep in mind when adopting these site procedures is that they may be in place for a number of months because we're entering kind of a, a new, a phase of a new normal. Uh, and they may need to be revised maybe a few times as restrictions are lifted or they may be tightened again at some point. And speaking of restrictions being lifted, it's worth mentioning that we are at stage one of the province's uh, reopening framework. Uh, and there, there isn't any timelines for when we're going to be uh, going to the next, next couple of stages, but uh, there are some recent changes that affecting housing providers uh, that came into force as early as this week. Uh, I think the, the two most important ones are restrictions being lifted on construction. So all construction projects uh, in the province can now move forward and regular repair and maintenance activities can resume. Uh, it's welcome news uh, to hear, but uh, when resuming these activities, it's still important to adopt practices uh, relating to health and safety. So for example, starting maintenance in someone's unit could still be a potential source of exposure for both the resident and, and the worker. Uh, and housing providers need to be aware of the guidance that the province has released for different types of sectors and employers. So for example, there are specific resources on workplace safety for uh, maintenance employees and uh, the construction sector. And then as we continue to reopen, uh, when thinking about whether to further uh, uh, open up and uh, lift restrictions, housing organizations should be asking themselves whether it's actually legal for them to do so. So if you're thinking about holding a meeting at some point in the future, you're going to need to look at whether it's actually legal to have so many people together and second if it's actually safe to do so housing providers can be more restrictive than uh, than what the current law allows but can't be more permissive so even though something might be legal at the time it may not necessarily be safe or may require extra precautions in order to be safe every community and housing complex uh, will need to assess their own unique situation and uh, implement procedures that are appropriate for, um, for loosening restrictions. And I think that uh, ending on the note that uh, the new procedures and uh, rules that we adopt are, are really gonna look like a different normal uh, we're not going to be going back to a pre-COVID-19 uh, time and how we hold meetings and uh, do maintenance work in, in housing complexes. So that's, I think, the bigger picture thing to keep in mind through all of this. So that is the end of our presentation and we'll take this time to answer some questions. Uh, Fraser, should I stop sharing at this point? Uh, I, I, your choice. It, you uh, you can continue using the um, the, the Zoom uh, panels to look at the questions uh, and, and 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 sharing your slideshow that no one else can see the questions, so you'll have to read them out loud. Okay, I don't think I can see the questions. I can I can read them out if you'd like me to. 
Okay, that would be great for there. Sure, okay. All right. Um, so uh, first we have a question. I'm wondering what your advice is regarding disclosure. Uh, you may have seen the CBC article. There's a link to a CBC article here. Um, my board was already discussing steps to be taken if we learn that someone is living in the co-op uh, who has COVID-19. Uh, as a first step, we are going to do a deep cleaning beyond our normal weekly cleaning if we come, become aware of this. One board member has said that we should warn members, but that has privacy red flags for me. A colleague indicated that they had put out a notice, but then everyone demanded to know who it was and was speculating. My view is that this is up to members to decide whether to disclose their health information to the co-op and also up to them whether the co-op has a right to share that information with members, either generally or specifically. As for the safety of other members and third parties, such as contractors, they should be taking universal precautions on the presumption that they could be a carrier or that anyone else could be, even if all parties appear to be. Carly, do you want to answer the question on disclosure? Carly, you're on mute. I saw it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so on disclosure, uh, your instinct is correct on this one. So it says in your question that uh, it's up to members to decide whether they disclose their health information. And that's absolutely true. So like I said, uh, privacy laws haven't changed. And it is not a housing provider or a board's responsibility to inform people. Um, if what I said earlier is if you live in a really large building, um, then putting up a notice saying that there's a presumptive case uh, can get people to adhere to social distancing a little bit better. Um, but as you said, that that can lead to speculation. So it really, whether you put up a general notice is up to your discretion, but when it comes to disclosing someone's information, that's not permitted under the privacy laws. Okay. Um, so I think that a couple of these questions have already been answered and may have been asked before you went over the, the information, but I'll read them out anyway. Um, so Todd asks, um, can you please discuss what renovations and or contract work needs to be postponed and what can proceed? Sure, I can answer that one. So the provincial government lifted restrictions on construction work and general repair and maintenance. So there isn't, there aren't specific restrictions on the type of renovations that can be done at this time. But uh, remember the two part question, is it legal and is it safe? So the fact that um, you can do renovations on a unit uh, and that it's legal now might not necessarily mean it's a good idea. So in, in this situation, we need to really be assessing whether uh, the construction work is necessary, whether there are, for example, health and safety implications as a result of not doing the work, um, or whether they, they, they can be um, postponed to a later time. Uh, if, they, if they do need to be done, uh, then it's important to take appropriate health and safety precautions. So for example, making sure that the residents aren't in the unit when someone is coming in, uh, and that contractors use uh, uh, personal protective equipment. Okay, uh, Selene asks, shouldn't you just assume the presence of COVID and clean accordingly? So it's a general uh, recommendation from public health to adopt increased cleaning protocols because uh, there are many people who may be positive and may, be, may not be showing symptoms. So the, the general recommendation has been to just uh, increase cleaning on all high touch uh, surfaces in, uh, in residential buildings. And the Toronto Public Health's guideline for uh, residential buildings is, is very helpful on this. Um, so I'd recommend you look at that. Great. Candace asks, we are a co-op. If we hold our GMM to approve our new budget virtually, do we legally have to make sure that everyone has the ability to join or just enough to make sure we have quorum? I know we should have everyone be able to join, but do we legally have to make sure they have access? That's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I think there there is I don't think I have a, a quick answer, 
Um, there is probably a legal answer to that, but also a, a community uh, relations question to, to that. And um, everyone should be able to participate in, uh, in the meeting. Um, but I understand that some people may not have, say, a, um, a virtual, uh, like a laptop and a webcam to participate in uh, a, a call or in that situation, I think, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't have a quick answer. I think the organization should make every effort to ensure members can participate. So if that means both allowing for people to call in via teleconference and participate via uh, Skype or, or Zoom, that would uh, certainly be an option, but uh, uh, yeah, I would, <laughs> that's what I have off the top of my head, but I think that's a, a good question. From a technical point of view, I can just weigh in that most of these webinar or uh, virtual meeting platforms have call-in options. So for instance, we have, uh, I think, five or so people calling in via their telephone to this webinar today. Um, so that makes these platforms fairly accessible. If you have a telephone, you should be able to access uh, one of these meetings. Uh, and so Ali asks, uh, is there any way to hold a members meeting for a federally administrated co-op if their bylaws don't have any indication that meeting that virtual meetings are legal? Ali, unfortunately, I don't know that answer uh, because I, I don't remember what the federal co-op uh, act says with respect to uh, to virtual meetings. So that that is something I can look into after after this. And maybe what we can do, Fraser, is uh, uh, when we post this, uh, we can post answers to some questions we weren't able to answer in the in the webinar. Sounds great. Great. Darlene asks, can we issue an NTA to a member for a virtual meeting? Can the board decide to evict after meeting with a member virtually? Carly, do you want to take this one? Yeah, um, yes, you can issue an NTA to a member for a virtual meeting. Um, what we've done for those is just, we have to state the place of the meeting and the time. You state what web platform it'll be held on. So Zoom at 7.15. And then just say that you'll send the link 24 hours before the meeting will be held or 12 hours, set a deadline that way. Um, and you can decide to evict a member after a virtual meeting as well. There's no restrictions on that. Evelyn asks, uh, does the website also have a recording of last week's webinar? The answer to that is yes. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, click on the education um, uh, navigation uh, item at the top of the screen and uh, it should be uh, right up at the top, I believe. Catherine asks, question around budgets for the next fiscal year. The board has approved our budget, but social distancing took effect before the members could approve. Can we continue using the budget numbers for this year? Or do you have another suggestion? Okay, so I'm assuming that this question relates to a co-op uh, and not a, a provincial or federal nonprofit. Um, to be honest, I don't know off the top of my head, but I know that um, the Cooperative Housing Federation of Canada has answered this in some of their resources. Um, and they've provided some options, uh, especially when a budget needs to be submitted to, say, the agency or to, uh, to a funder and what to do in the case of, um, say, housing charges needing to be um, increased. So this is something that we can answer uh, after the presentation. Great. Uh, Ellen asks, are roof gardens area to be uh, considered area to be closed? So this is something that you'd have to look at uh, the specific uh, uh, government directives about the areas that can be considered open. I know that uh, the province lifted some restrictions on community gardens. Um, so it would just be a matter of uh, 
looking at what what types of gardens are allowed to be uh, to be open and if they are then um, what measures need to be in place for allowing people to use those gardens. So okay, is Patricia the... is wondering when this presentation presentation will be available uh, as a video. Uh, it should be uh, sent out uh, probably as late as uh, tomorrow at the latest. Uh, Dave asks, are there slides? Uh, yes, so Dave's asking the same question. Uh, anonymous attendee is asking uh, us to elaborate on the statement, think carefully be before holding the virtual members meeting. Are you saying we should hold them for emergencies only? Uh, not necessarily. I, I mean, think uh, think about your community before deciding to hold a, a virtual meeting and who uh, will be able to participate and who might be excluded by the the format in which you're you're holding the meeting. So if the decisions for that meeting can be deferred to uh, a time when uh, more people can attend and when uh, there aren't the same restrictions in place and more people uh, there won't be the same number of people excluded because of the format that the meeting is being held in then that then th that might be the the preferable thing to do uh, candace asks uh if people are calling into a virtual meeting can we still hold a vote how do we know who is voting yes so you can uh, hold votes when people are uh, calling in via teleconference, but it, you just have to be very meticulous about uh, recording each person's vote. So that might mean going down the list of people attending and uh, having, having, them, um, having them vote, uh, express their vote individually rather than everyone uh, doing it at the same time. I, I think that uh, the mechanics of, of doing that can be complicated, so it's good to uh, seek advice before deciding on, on holding a, a virtual meeting. Uh, if you are considering doing it uh, uh, via a, a virtual platform, there are some, uh, some programs that, that allow for uh, virtual vote casting and that type of thing. Great. Um... A question from David uh, regarding breaches. Can a landlord be fined for tenant behavior contravening the emergency order? Sorry, I didn't, didn't hear that one. Oh, sorry. Uh, David is asking if a landlord can be fined for tenant behavior which contravenes the emergency order. I don't believe so. So, for example, if a, a if a um, tenant is hosting, say, a, a gathering of twenty people, um, I imagine that the the first person that would be held responsible is uh, the tenant themselves. But uh, it, I mean, there could there may be some exposure to a building that isn't taking. Uh, precautions to limit those types of things or um, or reporting them if they're if they're aware okay Bob is asking um, he says the AGM is scheduled for September the board elections would occur at that meeting is there an issue holding a virtual AGM using a platform such as zoom I think we've answered that one mm -hmm. Kathy asks what if state of emergency is lifted but still need to social distance by, but meeting room is not large enough for quorum. Can we still hold off GMM until social distancing ends? Yes, so if the state of emergency ends, there's still a period of, of time uh, under the current regulation. So 90 days after the end of the state of emergency is held uh, for an organization to call a meeting, but uh, I would imagine that if the state of emergency is lifted, um, that the province would be thinking about uh, 
the fact that organizations need to hold these meetings and and the realities of of uh, of that. So I think we could ex could reasonably expect um, some more directives on the government about what is or isn't allowed at that time, and and maybe even an extension of the time frame for holding uh, meetings. Okay, Anna asks, um, if a Bell technician wants to know if there is COVID in the apartment building, what is the appropriate answer? Carly, would you like to take that one? Um, I don't know if I know the answer. Uh, I think if you, if you know that you have a positive case and someone wants to know if there is a positive case, I would say that you're permitted to tell them as long as you don't give any personal details. That being said, Bell technicians should be behaving as if there's a positive case in every building and it shouldn't be adjusting anyone's behavior. Uh, Todd asks, are co-op managers required to work at this time or do individual co-ops have the right to determine their own way of operating at this time? So, I mean, I'd recommend that you look at Sophia's webinar on employment specifically. Uh, a lot of co-op managers are working remotely, but co-op offices, like the physical offices, aren't allowed to be open. So uh, in terms of whether co-ops or managers are required to work, the organization continues to operate. So um, there are, most of our clients still have staff uh, working. Okay, great. Um, uh, and then there are a couple of uh, clarifications uh, people, attendees posted in the chat here. Uh, Mary Ann Hannett um, uh, wrote that a federally funded co-op in Ontario is still governed by the Co-op Corporations Act, Act and the order would still apply. Um, uh, and Scott uh, stadger Piatowski uh, wrote, wrote uh, federal co-ops are allowed to hold electronic member meetings. CEHF Canada is doing so in June, and the cooperators and co-ops uh, and mutuals Canada have already done so. You should also refer to your own bylaws. Great. Okay, a uh, couple more here. Uh, Diana says, I sent a link to many clients to apply for help and support slash help in programs Many of them tried to apply or get in contact with providers and they informed me that they were not able to get in contact with anyone. Links are not available for phones. They don't have access to a computer. Can we have a list of phone numbers with names that they can send to clients, please? Thanks a lot. I hope this question is clear. I don't quite understand the question. Uh, I, I'm guessing it's it's asking about uh, whether tenants uh, information about tenants needing to apply for help and support, and I'm just based on the language. I'm guessing it relates to a nonprofit and not a cooperative. Um, so the Ontario Nonprofit uh, Housing Association (ONFA) um, has some very good resources, and I would use them as a first uh, step. Okay, one more question. Um, this one uh, seems to refer to a specific situation, but I'll uh, read it anyway. Uh, I have a client who lives in a co-op. She was living alone with one of her small children and her older son decided to move back in with her. He has a job making over $50,000 a year. When she informed management of the co-op, she lost her subsidy and started to pay full rent. Her son decided to move out and help her mother. The client uh, informed the co-op that my, my client informed the office of the co-op that they refused to give her back the subsidy. She is going to complete her year after she lost her review uh, slash subsidize. I called the Federation and they tried to help. No positive outcome. Can you or any participant in this webinar have any informational advice? So this is the type of question that we unfortunately can't answer because it relates to a very specific situation and would it, it needs legal advice. So that's, uh, that's my recommendation that, that your client actually seek specific legal advice on this. Okay, I think that's everything. Thanks everyone.
Thank you. Thank you.